morning. Good morning. It's certainly a pleasure to be here on the campus of um, Howard University. Uh, for someone from um, the Virginia Peninsula, we call this the other HU. But uh, my family has a very close uh, connection with, ha with um, Howard. My father uh, was a graduate of Howard. My first cousin graduated from Howard. My brother and brother-in-law went to the, to the dental school. And uh, my niece is here presently in the Divinity School. So I have a very close family connection to Howard, so it's a pleasure to be here. Now, Dr. Anderson has gone to great lengths to show uh, what we need to do and what we need to accomplish. Um, what I'm going to show is what the federal government uh, needs to do. Say again. Okay. Uh, what the federal government needs to do and our capability of actually doing it. Um, uh, one of the uh, problems, of course, is that uh, we have to come up with the money if we're going to have a jobs plan. Um, we know how to create jobs. Uh, if you spend government money, you can create jobs and transportation plan, in infrastructure, and things like that. The estimate is that you can create, a, for every billion dollars you spend, you can create about 30,000 jobs, about uh, 33,000 a job. Once you have a job, they'll spend the money and you'll create even, even more jobs. So if we had a $100 billion stimulus, we could create about 3 million jobs. And that's about uh, 250,000 per month. This morning we had another announcement that is about 150,000 uh, jobs created for the past uh, 30 to 40 months consecutively. We've had uh, around 100 to 200,000 jobs created. 250,000 additional jobs would mean that the growth would be actually doubled. But we have to um, have the money. And unfortunately, we're in um, uh, quite a mess right now. What I'm going to show is how we got here so that we can understand as we go forward, because it's unclear right now what we're going to end up doing after the cliff vote and by the time we've done the uh, budget, um, uh, fin finish the budget for the rest of the year, the um, uh, debt ceiling uh, and, and, and the sequester. By the time we've done all that, it's unclear where exactly we're going to be. But as that unfolds, it's nice to know how we got here and what the parameters are. Um, this is um, this is a uh, uh, red is uh, federal spending, blue is federal revenue. This is kind of how we got to where we are with the big deficit today. You can see that since the 1960. We've um, uh, pretty much spent more than we were taking in until the late 1990s, when you see that when President Clinton came in, we reduced spending and increased revenues and had a nice little surplus. Uh, when uh, President Bush came in, we went in exactly the opposite direction, uh, started um, uh, revenues collapsed, spending increased, and we have that huge, um, uh, huge deficit. Going forward, if we can tax at about 21 percent, we can pretty well get everything under control, but our problem is health care. And the Medicaid and Medicare, because, you know, we'd got everything under control if we, if we could control that. This is not a Medicare and Medicaid problem. It is a medical care problem. If you ask any business that's been providing health care insurance for its employees for the last 30 or 40 years, You'll find that 30 or 40 years ago, you got your coverage, family coverage, no copay or anything. About 30 years ago, well, we'll give you coverage, but you got to pay a little bit for your family. About 20 years ago, uh, you got to pay a little. You, you got to pay for your whole family a little bit by yourself. And about 10 years ago, you got to pay for your family and about half of yours. And if you draw that line to where we're going. Uh, this graph shouldn't surprise anybody. We've got to get health care under control. Um, as I indicated, when President Bush came in, he was looking at a 10-year $5.6 trillion surplus. By the time he en uh, ended his term, uh, President Obama inherited an $8 trillion 10-year deficit. The amazing thing about that is they didn't create any, just spent all that money and didn't even create any jobs. 
Um, this uh, says the same thing. Uh, public debt as a percentage of uh, GDP when uh, um, uh, President Bush came, when President uh, uh, Bush came in, he inherited, this is what he inherited, it looks like surpluses through the 1950s. Uh, when uh, President uh, Obama came in, he inherited uh, deficits as far as the eye could see. Uh, one of the <coughs> disappointments is um, uh, if we had continued going the way we had been going, uh, when President Bush was um, uh, inaugurated, we had hearings with Chairman Greenspan, and he had to answer questions like, are we paying off the national debt too quickly? What's going to happen when there are no government bonds? Because we were on the way to paying off the entire national debt by 2008 or 2010, somewhere in there, uh, debt held by the public. We would owe that blue line, China, Japan, and Saudi Arabia, we wouldn't owe them a dime. Unfortunately, we've gone in the opposite direction uh, with foreign debt exploding out of control. Now, I just put this uh, chart up here to shut people up about all we have to do is cut taxes and we will increase revenues. Green is a record revenue for the, for, for the, for the nation. Red is a year in which we did not set a new record for revenue. You'll see since 1961, we always, we're a growing nation, we always have new revenues. Good times, bad times, tax increases, tax decreases. Twice we didn't make a record, but the following year we did make a record. All the way up to those massive Bush era tax cuts where you've got all those red lines, um, put us in recession and everything else. Cutting taxes by President Bush did not increase, not only did not increase revenue, which you always do anyway, that is the worst revenue result that we've had since they had, this thing goes, you can take this chart back to the 1910s when we started the income tax. The worst results, so just shut up about, um, uh, if you just cut taxes, you'll increase revenues. Uh, we went into a recession, and the, um, um, this has the March 1980, July 81, June 1990, February 2001, and the current recession. How long did it take to get the jobs back that we lost in the recession? Um, in March, it took about um, nine months. In uh, 81, it took a little longer. 90, about the same. 91, you can see that we haven't even, after longer than any other time to get the jobs back, we haven't gotten them back, and if we keep going, at the rate we're going, it's going to be 2015 before we recover the jobs that we've lost. We're also a growing country. We need to actually uh, do a lot better than that because we need to create jobs just to keep up with uh, population growth. Now, we're coming out of it. As you can see, we're headed in the right direction. Uh, the stock market under Obama has gone up over 50 percent since, um, uh, since he came in, um, and, and he it was collapsing when he was sworn in and went down another 2,000 points before he could get the stimulus bill and everything enacted. All those tax cuts that were supposed to stimulate the economy are worst Dow performance since the Great Depression under President Bush. Um, we're also um, creating jobs. As I indicated, when uh, President Obama was sworn in, the uh, economy was falling off the cliff. We passed the stimulus. And I don't know how anybody can look at this graph and say the stimulus didn't work. We were in free fall, passed the stimulus, fewer and fewer job losses until the stimulus has kind of stabilized 100 to 150, 200,000 jobs uh, a month. Um, and what some of us are saying, if you have a little another stimulus, you could push that up a little bit and stabilize with better job performance but um, uh, they won't pass another, um, another stimulus. One major problem with this recession that we don't have um, with others is that the long-term unemployment is at historical highs. Uh, if you look at the percentage of people who have been out of work for over, for 20, for over 26 weeks, um, in a, the gray is the recession. In the other recessions, maybe 10% of them, 
Uh, in this, 40 percent of the people unemployed today have been unemployed for over 26 weeks. Uh, that, that's uh, a problem that we're going to have to address. Now, we have the budget, and one of the problems with cutting the budget and trying to um, uh, uh, balance the budget with cuts, a lot of the budget, when people think about cutting the budget, they're talking about that non-defense discretionary spending. Uh, you've got Medicare, Medicaid, Social Security, income securities like federal pensions and stuff like that, uh, net interest, and other kind of mandatory. Two-thirds of the budget is really out of touch. If they're not going to touch defense, you're left with 17 percent of the budget to absorb all the cuts. If you had a 10 percent across the board cut, a non-defense discretionary, you'd only reduce the size of government 1.7 percent. If you had a 10 percent across the board cut in everything, Head Start, transportation, FBI, uh, food inspectors, embassy security, and everything else, it would have a negligible effect on, uh, on spending. And that's um, really the challenge. Uh, if you're going to have significant cuts, if you're not going to solve your budget problems with revenues and try to do it with cuts, you'll either savage the non-defense discretionary or you've got to go into Social Security and Medicare. Now, what we did, we passed this uh, uh, cliff thing. As I, as I have suggested, the Bush tax cuts was what got us in trouble, and now we're uh, voted uh, to extend the tax cuts on January 1st. It was a bill that extended the tax cuts at a cost of about $4 trillion. Now, uh, we haven't said how we're going to pay for it yet, which uh, reminds me of a story that our governor, Jerry Blouse, tells about Ed Willey, who was chair of the uh, Finance Committee when I was in the State Senate. He had a well-deserved reputation for being conservative. He was stingy. He couldn't get a dime out of him with a crowbar, was what people said. Well, he walked into a bar shortly before an election and heard the people mumbling. Oh, there go Ed Willey. Nobody here voting for Ed Willey. He's too stingy. He can't get a dime out of him with a crowbar. And he was listening to all this and lifted his beard, turned to the bartender and said, bartender? When Ed Willie drinks, everybody drinks. It said the whole house people couldn't believe it. They started celebrating. No, Ed Willie, Ed Willie got my vote. Why are you talking bad about Ed Willie? He's all right with me. Set up the house like that. He's got every vote in here. Oh, they were celebrating. After a few minutes, he took a couple of dollars out of his pocket, put it on the bar, said, Bartender. Everybody looked up, Bartender. When Ed Willie pays, everybody pays. <laughs> I say that because. We are in the celebratory part of that story because we passed the tax cuts. Everybody got the tax. Ninety-nine percent of the people got their tax cuts extended. Everybody's celebrating. Everybody's members of Congress prancing around. Look what happens when we work together, all bipartisan and all that. How are you going to pay for it? Anybody know? No, we don't know. And that is uh, the challenge. The, the fiscal cliff deal, first of all, um, added to the deficit, I said it was a $4 trillion uh, 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 tax cut. Uh, if we hadn't passed it, the budget um, deficit would be about $200 billion in 2022. Um, now it's going to be about almost $800 billion um, added to the deficit. Uh, the deal was uh, basically extending tax cuts from uh, up to $450,000 uh, uh, per couple. Uh, it saved um, the estate tax up to uh, husband and wife $10 million. You pay no estate tax um, rather than $1 million under, uh, $2 million husband and wife under Clinton. And a couple of years ago, they moved it up to $7 million husband and wife. Uh, now they moved it up to $10 million. The alternative minimum tax has been indexed to inflation. We ended the Social Security 2 percent payroll tax, so most people actually experienced a tax increase as we spent $4 trillion cutting taxes. Uh, child uh, tax credit, earned income tax credit, education tax credits were not made permanent. They were just extended five years. The R&D investment expensing, unemployment insurance was extended another year. 
Um, we, fig we fixed the doc fix. We had a kind of um, phantom cut in Medicare with draconian cuts in provider fees. Every year we added it back. So we've, um, we've uh, fixed that for a little while. We did not address the sequestration. We did not affect um, the uh, debt ceiling. And we haven't done anything about the fact that we funded government not for the fiscal year through uh, September 30th, but only through about March. We've got to deal with that. Now, how are we going to pay for this um, sequester? Uh, we have some choices. Um, the fiscal cliff deal, uh, almost four trillion, almost four trillion dollars in um, in green. The sequestration, if we let that go through, that'll cover um, uh, less than about a third of it, 1.2 trillion. Uh, if you look at where you're going to get the money, the entire non-defense discretionary and the defense discretionary um, in blue, if you just look at the size, there's no way you can get that kind of savings out of that kind of budget. You've almost got to go into Social Security and Medicare to pay for the um, uh, fiscal cliff deal. Um, the, um, there are some ways to pay for it if you use revenues rather than spending cuts. Uh, if, you just, if you went back to the $1 million, $2 million a couple uh, uh, Clinton era estate tax, pay, start paying tax over $2 million, uh, you would save, you would get an additional $388 billion. If you just went back to where it was a couple of years ago, 3.5 million apiece, 7 million husband and wife, you get $135 million, a billion dollars. Incredibly, if we raise the age of Medicare, that would only help $125 billion. If we cut the, it's what they call chain CPI, cut the cost of living for, for Social Security like they're talking about, that's a little over $100 billion. If you just look at these numbers, if we end up cutting Medicare in order to, uh, to save some money, in the same budget cycle that we fixed the estate tax, we would have to, to save, to, to help the tax problems of dead multimillionaires, we would have raised the age of Medicare from 65 to 67. Now, one of the problems we've got is we're doing this kind of sequentially. You cut the taxes, then you look for some spending cuts. Why didn't you do it all at once? If you say, well, here are the tax cuts, and here's how we're going to pay for it, you can make a rational decision. Say, no, I'm not going to cut Social Security and Medicare in order to preserve tax cuts. And so you could vote no. But uh, getting you to go along with the tax cuts first, you kind of box people in to where now they've got to make some decisions uh, whether we're going to raise their age of Medicare or cut Social Security. There are some um, um, other ways of raising the money. If you tax capital gains and dividends, like regular income, you could get almost a trillion. 5% additional uh, tax on that portion of your income over a million dollars gets you about um, a half a billion. When we went to 250 to 450 in terms of who gets the tax cut, nobody talked about how much revenue would be lost. It's about $200 billion. And if you look at these numbers, if we end up raising the age of Medicare to 67, we would have raised the age of Medicare to 60, 65 to 67 in order to preserve those tax cuts for that portion of your income from 250 to $450,000. Those are the kinds of decisions that we're going to make. Now, we are where we are. We're going to end up having to fight the best we can uh, from where we are. but. We have to make sure that we fight to preserve Social Security and Medicare. We have to make sure that we fight to make sure there are investments in education, make sure there are investments in jobs, make sure that we do what we can to make sure that when we pay for these tax cuts that we vote for, that we do it in a rational and comprehensive way. We know that all of these uh, spending cuts and austerity has not worked in Europe. In fact, the uh, fiscal cliff deal is estimated by the Center for American Progress to be a drag of 1.6 to 1.9 percent of GDP uh, when, it's, when it's phased in. That's about all the increase in GDP we've seen in the last couple of years. So this is where we are. This is how we got here. 
But the last thing we want to do is to, is to cut Social Security, Medicare, education, uh, things like that, in order to provide for these tax cuts and not have any money left over for a jobs bill to solve the problems that Dr. Anderson outlined. Thank you very much.